Hey, folks. Uh, I'm part of the organizing committee, and when the um, opportunity to introduce our last keynote of the conference came up, I jumped on it because, for one, personally, I owe a lot to Peter Wong for his support and my new fund. Um, but I just wanted to also highlight for folks here, for Pi data nerds who might be just into the tech and all of his accomplishments in Python and the SciPy and scientific Python world know what a great business leader he is. So he's been CEO for a little over three years and in that short time has really taken the company to some new heights um, and has continued his great support of the Python community including the num focused dividend. Um, he's closed some big partnerships with Snowflake, uh, Microsoft Azure and Oracle including an investment by Snowflake but let me turn it over to one of the people that I think knows Python better than just about anybody other than some of the core developers and the creator himself. So Peter Wong, our final keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. And um, uh, you know, it's usually better if you set the bar low so you can uh, overachieve rather than set a very high bar like that. I'm sure there are plenty of people here in this room who know um, more things about Python than I do in many ways. And, uh, and actually one of my things that I've done, I've enjoyed the most, has been coming up with a lot of crazy ideas and then making them someone else's problem. Uh, so a lot of the great projects and open source things that now have taken root and that we've created at Anaconda or incubated um, have become, like so I, I sort of birth the puppies and make them someone, have someone else raise them. Uh, which is maybe a skill, maybe a curse, I don't know. But, um, but uh, I, you know, I actually, the last time I was here at Pi Data Seattle was in 2015. Was anyone here at that event other than me? All right. Do you all remember the PowerPoint karaoke they made me do at the end? It was, it was awesome. They sprung it on me at the last minute, which I really appreciated. And uh, Steve Dower and Sherok and some others were just advancing random slides. Or I think there's a picture of meerkats. There's some other stuff. And I had to come up with something to say. And I thought about, you know, it would actually be kind of fun to redo that this time, but with ChatGPT. And then I realized, no, that's going to be a complete chaos, and like, that's not what anyone wants to hear. So I decided not to do that and spare you that. Instead, I'll talk about something much, much more um, encouraging and hopeful and optimistic, which is, will open data science lead to the end of the world? Uh, at least the end of the human populated world, right? Um, and sorry, just as a spoiler, I'm not going to actually answer this question, but I'll be speaking to it in some ways throughout the entire talk. So. Let's start by just taking a look back. That was on the left here. We have um, PyData 2015, you have Shirok down there, you know, Matt Rocklin, Jake Vonderplas, Brian Granger, lots of good people. Um, it was a really, really fantastic event. And as always, we're very, very grateful to Microsoft for providing us a brilliant venue for it. Um, and now this year, you know, it's, it's grown. There's, of course, now so many more people using Python data science, much more diverse representation of practitioners and speakers. It's so great. Um, but in looking at this, you know, the question is, how do we actually, whoa. That's, that's a lot better. Is this better? Can you guys? Is it a little better right here? Yep. All right, great. I, wow, I didn't know this was, this was like we turned it to 11 right here. OK. Um, but if we look at um, how, how we sort of got here, why, why was there such an adoption? Um, the, my theory behind it, this is, OK. How about this right here? So my theory behind why, why we got so much adoption is because really there was an opportunity at the time to pick up grassroots usage in all these places that IT had basically cordoned off. And so how many of you work in a larger business where you have to kind of go through a lot of IT hoops to get stuff done? Show of hands. Two hands over there. That's extra pain right there. A lot of pain in each hand. Um, and so if, for those of you who don't know, because a lot of people didn't raise your hands, there are actually Maybe I'll turn this guy on. Hello? Oh, hold on. Is this fine? Oh, OK. All right, great. Well, oh, even on the lapel was OK? Oh, OK. I just like being louder, but OK, well, fine. We'll turn it back down to eight. Um, so if you, for those of you who did not raise your hands, the, the double-handed pain that that person is expressing uh, comes from the fact that for a long time now, businesses managed overall sort of technology as a word. Um, they've managed information systems by really sorting them into a few silos. And these are the major ones. One of them is infrastructure, computers, um, the systems, the networking, how do you uh, operationalize and manage deployments. 
Another silo is data management, you know, uh, things like data governance, privacy, uh, database architectures, and which databases to use, all these different kinds of things. And then another one is analytics, which is usually smaller, actually, um, because a lot of businesses are not very analytical. They run on spreadsheets and shoot from the hip. So, um, so the analytics units usually have, you know, they, they, but sometimes they drive a lot of compute, okay? But they do have to go and do modeling of, you know, what came in and what does this mean and produce another spreadsheet for somebody else. Um, and that's where some of the older analysis languages like SAS and older tools like that got used. And what happened is that we had multiple technical disruptions coming in all the same time in the 2000s. Uh, big data, of course, uh, you know, over, I guess, 15 years ago started transforming things. The mainstream adoption of cloud computing, and then early, early sort of machine learning uh, applications. And all of these things just blew up the silos. Um, and so what happened is that when you have tools like open source Python or open source R, anyone can just pick these up and start using them. And in fact, what's really interesting is if you, if you think about it, the overlap between any two of these failed silos, if you look at these as silos from above, the overlap of use cases that were not being adequately served by any of these silos, they sort of emerged into new little practice areas. Um, data engineering, when that first started showing up as a term outside of DBA and data warehouse kind of stuff, it was because people were trying to cobble together cloud architectures and NoSQL stuff and a bunch of Python scripts and some other stuff. And that became kind of data engineering and a lot of like, um, the modern data stack stuff is sort of an outgrowth of that now. Um, and in the intersection of the needs of advanced analytics and IT not providing the amount of computers that they needed to do those analytics or the kinds of computers, the kinds of GPUs, you had rushing into this space a lot of that early adoption of Python. And that then, in the convergence of all of these things, was this nebulous group of just lost orphaned children, essentially, doing really important work, but they sort of would all go and meet at conferences like Open Data Science, or they'd go to Strata, or they'd come to PyData, or they'd go to the R user conference, right? And so, really, the emergence, the adoption, going back to that first slide, why do we have so much growth in usage? We have so many more people here, this is great. The reason is because there was an underserved uh, set of use cases that were clearly valuable. It wasn't just child's play, it was clearly generating value and insight for business. And that's where really open data science kind of came to, to, the, to fruition. And one of the key things here is the word open in open data science, right? Um, and those of you who are familiar uh, with, the, with the open source movement, which is you know, related, of course, um, we use that word open to mean several different kinds of things, right? And we've, um, you know, there's sort of like, does open mean free? Right? If it's open source, it means you can get it and use it for free, like free as in beer, right? Which is the, what the open source people have been saying for a long time. Um, does open mean that I can read the source code? And over here is the source code breakdown for sci-fi. How many of you have read all of that? Not Travis, but other than Travis, how many of you have read all of that Fortran 77, all the C++ header files, right? So open source, even though it's, you can read the source, most people don't, right? Um, you just kind of use it because it's free. But, but if you have improvements to suggest, one nice thing about open is that it's open for, 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 for improvement. So if you found a bug somewhere, you can submit a patch to something to you know, add some functionality. But even though you can go and read the source code, and even though you can get it for free, you can read the source code, you can even go and write patches to the source code, it doesn't necessarily mean that the maintainer, maintainer community are open to your ideas, right? So open has many different kinds of meanings. And when we say open data science or open source software for data science, that open has a lot of different meanings. And different people mean different things by that. And that's where we actually get to some interesting ecosystem sort of breakdowns. But one thing that I think is really important about this is to recognize that when businesses adopt this stuff, right, it's not actually just about the licenses. It's not about necessarily the cost of it. What it really is is it is allowing many different people to come around and innovate together. It allows communities to form collaboration communities. They may not always agree. They may have different perspectives. But because we've reduced the barrier to adoption and the barrier to usage to so low, you can bring in all sorts of people that otherwise would have sort of been gatekept out of the conversation. And in doing this, you have a group of, you have a community of people, a lot of them are volunteers. You know, it's free software, they're not getting paid to go work on it most of the time. But because they are able to have direct contact with the users, that cycle of innovation runs faster. And that's what's allowed, again, this adoption to happen, and then it's allowed the innovation to happen, because it's an open innovation community. But one of the things that I think, oh, geez, I keep jumping around. One of the things that I think people miss in this conversation around open source and how we love the community, I just came from, from PyCon um, in Salt Lake City, um, and 
you know, people there at PyCon talk about community all the time. It's so great, and that's all they talk about sometimes, it seems like. But, um, but when they talk about the community, I think one of the things that, that the, maybe people who are somewhat new to the space, so certainly people who are maybe more data practitioners and not really in the software space, something that you miss sometimes is that when you're really in this for a while, you realize that the code is not the important part even. It's not about can you, can you, uh, can you read the source code or can you submit pull requests to the source code. Um, what's really important is actually the source code is actually an artifact that's the result of a collaboration. Right, so, so when you look, if, for instance, you think about a band, what's important about a band is that those particular band members are jamming together and they produce some of the music. So the music is important, of course, if they didn't ever produce music that you could listen to, you probably, probably wouldn't be so interested in them. But a band is more than just the music. But we, and we talk about the bands, we talk about the people. But when it comes to software, we don't talk about the people very much. We talk about the code. Hey, what version of sci-fi are you on? What version of pandas? Are you using this distributed system or that distributed system, right? What, what app, what thing, what thing, what thing? We're very focused on the software and we completely, it's like, what song do you like? What song do you like? What song do you like? And no one ever talks about the artists. No one ever talks about the bands. That's kind of the, my, not, what is it, myopia, it's the blind spot we have as users of this stuff sometimes, right? So I, 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 I find this really, really important to stress to people that software isn't just the code, and for maintainers and practitioners, or for maintainers and developers, it's, it's also just not a matter of you writing some code and shipping it to a bunch of randos on the internet. It's really about building a relationship and building that community, and out of that community, better ideas you know, are formed and, and people have conversations. And so really, we can talk about software as being the artifact, or we can talk about the community that produces it, but we really should see this thing rel relatively holistically as sort of the fruit and the tree that bears the fruit. And in fact, there's also a soil that the tree is grounded in. So if we think about this as, you know, from this perspective, then I think we can sort of appreciate that the reason the PyData community has grown so much, the reason why uh, people have, um, uh, you know, why, why we've been able to produce new innovations and new projects, and even though some everything's got warts on it, everything's got some rough edges, but people still use it, and it still does the job pretty darn well. Um, and that, I'm, I'm going to keep my finger off the keyboard. Um, and so, um, but that, that's that's actually an intentional result because this community actually does see itself as a community, and it actually, for the most part, you know, people who are probably pretty famous for having written pieces of software. If you actually talk to them, you'll be shocked at how much time they spend managing the people and personalities and the governance and the dynamics around these different projects so they can continue to yield good fruit uh, in the years to come. But even then, one of the things that people, even, even people who are in this space uh, and those maintainers who under, appreciate the community dynamics, there's something quite radical, a perspective I have, I guess, um, but there's a quite a radical perspective I have that maybe a lot of people don't have or, or don't fully understand which is that open source software is not actually property. It's a weird economic artifact. It's an unproperty. And what that is is there's, there's, very, there's almost nothing else in the world like it, maybe fire. But I can't think of other physical objects where the more of it that you give away, the more there is. Um, and so this is really, really, really screwed up because er all of our intuitions about economic systems, about economic models, are not this. There's no apple such that if you cut it in half, there's, there's more of it. Right? There's no, there's no stream or no river in the world that if you, if you dam off one tributary, you get more water out of it. There's not, almost nothing in the world that by itself creates more of this kind of thing. Um, and so in the early days of software, there was no such thing, I mean, before people really called it software, it was just you know, code that people traded with each other when they spent a ton of money buying super expensive hardware. And only with the advent of the PC and people, everyone being able to buy computers, was there now a market, a need for software to run on those computers? And that's you know, when people like Bill Gates came around and really created the software industry around essentially a concept. And this all kind of formed up in the 70s and 80s. But they used copyright, they used some I, basically some of these kind of frameworks of IP law to take this thing which was basically unbounded, shareable, sort of Jeffersonian, I light your candle with mine and we have, you know, my flame does not reduce or whatever, whatever the exact quote is uh, that I butchered. But the point is, that we had this thing that was fundamentally generative, open, abundant, and then we used copyright law and IP law to actually create some economics around it. Now you can argue whether that's been good or bad. Uh, I'd argue it's pretty good that people can get incented to, to you know, put in the hard, economic, or hard intellectual labors to create good software. But at the same time, 
one can maybe argue that there's, there's a way to over-rotate on that, right, and, and have too much of that. Um, so the open source community, the free software movement, uh, you know, pick your term that you want, but that, that movement really is a counterculture, and it is, um, to some extent, antithetical to the very premise of turning code, an intellectual artifact, into property. So every single one of you is a rebel, whether you know it or not. Every time you go onto a GitHub tracker and tell the developer, I tried this thing and this didn't quite work, and I think the bug might be here, what you're doing is you're adding a little bit of fire to a gigantic roaring fire, a little bit of flame to a gigantic roaring fire over here that shows the world a different way that we could be doing all of this. And this is really important because um, at Anaconda, as a business, we do interact with a lot of other businesses. We sell software to other businesses. And when we talk to them, we'll oftentimes come across uh, potential customers who will insist that they don't have open source software, they, they're not allowed to use open source or whatever, and they're running Linux everywhere, right? <laughs> you know, they've just got all this stuff everywhere. And it's such a really interesting thing that people, just how invisible some of the foundational open source stuff really has been. But we've transformed all of this stuff. And, and really, the community that has created the tools that you all use, that community over the last 10, 15, well, 20 years to some extent, we have really laid the foundations for, for all the modern ML stuff, not all of it, but a lot of the modern ML stuff, and certainly a lot of the AI stuff. And the reason that Python is a language for AI is because of the hard work of all the people in that community. But, but, at the end of the, but the reason I want to say this thing about this unproperty, this weird economic thing, I'll get to later, but I just want to put this out there to, for all of you to recognize that you are benefiting from an economic interaction model that is literally antithetical. It, is, it could not be more Marxist, basically. It's completely antith antithetical to the current um, general economic schemes in the world around the commercialization, the propertyization of, of, uh, of intellectual property, or of ideas. OK, so one last thing I would say about this thing, this section, before we move to the next section, is that um, the, there's, a, there's a famous principle in um, whatever, software systems or, or you know, software management. Um, which says that it's called Conway's Law. And it says that the architecture of a software system um, ultimately mirrors the organization structure of the team or teams that produce that software. So if you give a group of, like, let's say you have a, a software dev team and they have three sub teams, and you say, hey, I want to build this kind of an app, what you'll end up with is the architecture for that app that has three components to it, generally, or three layers, or three something. And if it was four groups, you'd end up with four layers. And if it was a database team and some other things, you would end up with a thing where there was a heavy data component being run by the database team and some other things. Um, and, and the flip side of this, um, and it's, it's, I know it's a bit cheeky to quote your own tweets in your slides, but, um, but people d don't necessarily take this principle. And I've seen personally, I've seen this principle validated over and over in life. But um, I think people don't take this principle far enough, which is, again, this idea that code is a cultural artifact. If you have closed source development, if you have a bunch of people getting paid 9 to 5 to do a miserable job of writing to some spec they don't care about, for some app they don't care about, they'll never actually see shipping because it won't ship until years after they've already quit that job, you'll end up with code that kind of is miserable. <laughs> you'll end up with apps that are kind of miserable, and it's just all sort of miserable. But if you actually have a lively community interaction around this kind of stuff, you end up with code that, well, maybe it's a little janky sometimes, but it's got, there's a certain amount of love in it. There's a certain amount of care and quality in it. That's ineffable. And so that's, I, I just really want to ex um, emphasize that, that we keep talking about, you know, we talk about software, we can talk about license around software, but at the end of the day, the really important thing is the people who produce these things, the cultural dynamics of those people. And so what are those cultural dynamics? Well, in the open source community, it's about that community, right? It's not a place where people are coming in and saying, how much more money can I make if I ship this line of code? It's, it's actually a participatory culture. In economics, they call it a gift economy. The more you give, the more clout you get, right? The more you take care of others, the more stuff comes back to you. It's a really beautiful, generative, abundant sort of thing. And the important thing here is that trust, in general, is the most important currency. Trust in a person, trust in a group of people, trust in a brand. Some, some companies do actually end up earning trust in this space. It's rare, but it does happen. Um, and trust is very easily lost, right? as we all know. So this is a really important dynamic of that community. And the community values for Python in particular, I think, are one of the things that have made it successful. When Python first got started back in, I mean, the 90s, 
it was just one of these other fun little toy scripting languages. There were many. Perl was the dominant thing. If you wanted to write serious code, you would write C. Um, and then as the web emerged, people started doing things in Perl and PHP. And, and Python and Ruby could do a little bit of web apps. But at the end of the day, Python was just yet another language. But what was interesting about the design of that language and that community was that they were quite welcoming. They were quite open to ideas from randos, randos like the numerical computing community who showed up and said, you know what, we can overload this and do that, and we can make this thing almost like a crappy version of MATLAB. Hey, that's a great idea. And they accepted it. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then it's like, well, the crappy version of MATLAB got a little better and a little better over time. And eventually it got like a lot better. And so the ability for a, and this is really important, right? Because if you, uh, for those of you who were alive during the 90s and remember that time, that was a very opinionated time on the internet. I don't know what it is like now, but it was very opinionated back then. And a lot of people, man, when they had a cool computer, like language project, whatever, that was their thing. They were all, they just smeared their ego right over that thing, and you couldn't get in there. But the Python community was more fun. I mean, it was, you know, for those of you who don't know, Python is not after, named after a snake, it's named after Monty Python. And so on the mailing list, if you go back and look at the archives, there are a ton of Monty Python jokes. Dumb ones, good ones, I mean, there's a lot of them, right? So it was that kind of a fun community, an open community, and frankly, a language that, came from a guy who was trying to build a, a, a thing called computer programming for everyone, right? A, a language or a thing that allowed everyone in the world to write code. That's very different conceptually and from a heart, it comes from a different heart space than, you know, a bunch of Unix, bearded Unix hackers want to make the, like, the most hardcore thing possible. Um, one of the guys I knew in, um, back at Cornell, uh, who was actually, he helped start the Cornell Linux users group with me back then, uh, really, really amazing hacker. But his claim to fame was that he took a three-line Perl, there was at the time, I think, uh, implementation of, of uh, I think it was RSA, and it was in three lines of Perl. He managed to turn it into two lines of Perl. And I'm like, that's not Perl, that's a cat on your keyboard, man, that's not a, but anyway, it worked. I mean, it worked, it was RSA, I guess, but the point is, it was, there was a whole lot of that kind of thing going on in the 90s. Um, and, uh, and so into that, you have something very different, right? A space, a language created by somebody who said, let's just use white space, let's make it readable, let's just let, you know, make it, always make it readable, right? There should be one obvious way to do it. Um, and so they welcomed the people that came in and brought weird ideas, like Travis and others who brought in so many math ideas. And then when, when, um, when that really sort of took on a life of its own, we tried to continue and extend that, right? And so one of the things I remember, um, uh, well, I mean, actually, we're sort of running a long time, so I should stop with the reminiscences. Maybe over beer later. But um, by the end of the day, I think where I've come to really reckon, uh, one thing I've come to recognize is that the Python communities, one of the core values that's really important is that it is not about technology just for technology's sake. Right? When, we, when we actually convene, when we're talking at the, you know, at, at, as, as a, at the non-focus level, or when I'm talking to PSF people at the Python Foundation, we're always talking about education. We're talking about how do we bring in more people into the community? How do we make sure things are accessible for uh, young learners? And, or not young learners, for people who are newer to the ecosystem. Um, at PyCon, you know, I was sitting next to uh, Eric Holscher, who's the read the docs, write the docs guy, um, and we were talking about how do we, you know, he, he felt that there was a, a lack of interest now in writing documentation. That's really important, because if we don't have good docs, then the stuff becomes really, really unapproachable to, 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 to new users. And so there's just a general, in the, in, the, in the groundwater, in the ecosystem, there's a general sentiment of really caring about the people using the technology, not just the tech. Uh, and I think that is, unfortunately, from what, I've seen, from what I've seen, I've been around a lot of different tech groups and communities, that is unfortunately really rare. It's a very precious thing here in the Python community. Um, and and one, one of the important things now that we've gotten to a point of adoption where Python is so everywhere, it is so ubiquitous, and it is the language of AI. One of the fundamental things that we have to remember is that a computer language is not just for people to talk to computers, it's for people to be able to communicate with each other. That's why the readability counts thing mattered so much. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why SciPy and, and, and PyData took off the way they did, is because you could have somebody who could write some Python code, and if the code was you know, not too inscrutable, someone else who maybe knew it just a little bit could read it and generally guess what was going on. Or they could tweak a couple of things and it would still basically work. And so for those of you who are now in a post-COVID era understand what an R value is, this kind of technology has an R value that's greater than one. Because it's not just one lonely hacker turning RSA from three lines to two, it's some really, really, uh, a haggard astrophysicist or geneticist or someone 
who cobbles together some half-baked notebook and gives it to their colleague who just learned Python last week, and their colleague is actually able to be productive, and they're able to remix it, and they're able to use it. And so you have an R value that is much, much greater than one, actually. And so this idea that language is a human instinct, and it's a natural path to insight for us, that really led me to this really, um, I think, a very fundamental, fundamental insight, which is that if computer languages are done well, and they're made usable by everyday people, not just computer nerds and hackers, then it becomes thoughtware, not just software. Right? Software makes you have to click on buttons, select drop downs, figure out how to scroll through something, or what set of options will cause it to do something else. That's, that's, that's like picking from, that's picking from recipe, picking from menu. That's software, and generally software's crap. But, but if you can actually build something that feels like it extends people's ability to think, then you're producing thoughtware. And that's a very different kind of thing. OK, so that then led to, so this kind of progression in the Python community, um, watching all this stuff get adopted and grow, I realized that we were starting to hit growing limits even. Um, and I just asked this very provocative question, I guess, a very simple question, but how many software developers are there? Right? If Python's the number one language and Python starts taking over and wins, wins, whatever that means, um, the language wars, and so many people are using it, we're number one, yay. But at the end of the day, there's only about 25 million, even on a conservative basis, if you really want to go like swing big, you say there's 50 million people in the world that can code. So if we get every single one of those people, there's still 8.5 billion other people, plus or minus 50 million, that can't code. Right? And so we can talk about literacy, we can talk about access, democratized data science, blah, blah, blah. You can talk about this all day long. There's 8 billion people who don't get any of it. And that's not a great setup for where we're going as a civilization. And that is what led last year to creating, uh, to, 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 to me coming up with the idea for PyScript and us really pushing it hard now as a company, is it was realized that it wasn't just about the code, it was about the complexity of all of the other crap that's not the code. Right? And so you think about how much of your time you spend coding versus how much of your time you spend fighting infrastructure, debugging YAMLs, going and figuring out if some con cloud containers up or not, going and figuring out what is the access pattern for this database, or what's the schema for that thing, or, or emailing somebody else for some script for the other. So much of what makes computing completely miserable has very little to do with the language nowadays, and everything to do with the unbounded amount of complexity that's out there around the code. So, what we want to do is take all of that away and make it so that at least we go back to a place where people who have never coded before can just do something very simple and get to an environment where they can write a little code, build something that works, and share it with someone else. And so we created PyScript, which for those who don't know, is a WebAssembly-based Python runtime. It's a framework that uses an underlying thing called Pyodide uh, or um, MicroPython. And it basically runs Python inside the browser, inside the tab itself just like if it was a little bit of JavaScript. And so you can write Python code in line with your HTML, and it just runs. And it's fantastic and fun. If you haven't checked it out yet, go to PyScript.com and play with it. And our goal here was to make it so that it is accessible. It is a child's first instruction of programming. They can go from logo-like things to drawing little things and making animated 2D platformers to doing you know, um, webcam-based machine, machine learning uh, image recognition stuff, just all of it. You don't have to install anything. You'll, you'll almost never hear the Anaconda CEO telling you you don't have to install Anaconda. But in this case, you don't have to install Anaconda. You just go to PyScript.com, and you've got it. right? And so the idea here is you just need a text editor, you just need a browser, and you're good to go. And the important thing about that is access. Because there are so many people in so many countries, so many places, that can't get a fiber connection in the latest and greatest MacBook, right? This stuff runs, WebAssembly runs, on 4 billion devices. It runs on Chromebooks. It runs on phones and tablets. It runs on mobile, um, uh, mobile browsers across all the major mobile platforms. And so this is tremendously democratizing for people. And so we want to make the, again, like it says, we want to make the web a friendly and hackable place again. We want to ease all those deployment pains for people. And this year at PyCon, we set up a booth where we're showing how you can, yeah, again, you just go to PyScript.com or you set up a local PyScript thing, you write some code and it runs, and you literally ship the HTML to your neighbor, and now they've got the app. So your, so your deployment method is drop into the Dropbox or into the shared drive. Or, or zip up the HTML and, and email it to them. That's your deployment method. And that's, that's just such a game changer in terms of ease of use compared to teaching someone, here's how you set up a cloud key, here's how you set up this other thing, create this machine image, and blah, blah, blah. So, so we, we were very, very excited about this. And then, I don't know if you guys noticed, but around November, this thing called ChatGPT showed up. And it said, well, 
I guess all you have to do now to write code is just to ask something to write the code, which is kind of cool, right? Um, but the interesting thing about ChatGPT is that it wasn't just it wasn't just the underlying GPT model because that's been around for a little while. It was the interface was so simple. And again, kind of coming back to that whole thing about accessibility, if you make it because language is a where is it here? Language is a human instinct. So if you give a natural language interface, then that's the most natural interface you can provide to a human almost. Um, so when you have something like ChatGPT showing up, and now everyone in the world is looking at this thing like, wow, not only can I ask it to you know, whatever, write Shakespearean poetry or make jokes or whatever, I can use this thing to actually build software systems. I can make this thing, I can ask it, I don't know if those of you have played around with this a little bit or follow this stuff on, on, uh, on social media, but there is just stuff every single day that people are doing that is just mind blowing. And most of it works, that's the amazing thing. It mostly works. It doesn't work all 100% of the time, but it mostly works. Um, and so I think when we think about access, when we talk about where is all this stuff headed, well, you know, this is quite some success, right? Because the, the adoption of Python as the language for data science and machine learning allowed a tremendous amount of evolution, a tremendous amount of innovation and research to happen, which then led to the creation of things like transformers and whatnot. And so now we're at a point where we've hit the next frontier in terms of accessibility. We've now unlocked a portal to lots and lots of people being able to start asking questions and building data systems and building all these things. And so, um, just checking the time here. Um, OK, that's all I'll say about that. So this next section, I guess, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I will say is with, with the GPT stuff, we've also got now, it's, uh, it's so good at making up stuff. It's so good at just coming up with text, which we thought was a human level activity. Now we have a lot of people nowadays talking about um, it leading to the end of the world and um, killing us all. And you know, we've had much dumber things that could have killed us all over the years. And so this is a very smart thing. And maybe it would kill us all much more effectively. Um, and so this next phase of the, of the talk is sort of like, um, you, you, those of you who remember listening to the radio, Delilah. So this is now hot takes from Poing on the state of AI right now. Um, and so we'll just go through one at a time. Let's just state one at a time. Um, so number one, so the current state of LLM technology, because they're hallucinators, they will require a lot more work before they can be seriously deployed at scale in business for a variety of reasons. There are some things that they can do which are already amazing for certain kinds of B2C applications. For certain kinds of data transformation uh, applications, it, it's amazing what they can do. But, but before they can really go into production in, in, in business, there's a lot more work that each business has to do to think about. And one of those reasons is because they are basically bullshit generators, right? The problem is that 90% of white collar work is bullshit. So there is a commoditization effect, I think is a euphemism that economists use. There's a commoditization effect that will happen here. Um, and then the really, the, the, the really interesting thing is, for those of you in the room who write code, is that code generation works remarkably well with these things. Not, it's not perfect, but it's really freaking good. And so, um, uh, you know, some naturally software developers are like, well, crap, this doesn't mean that I'm going to lose my job because people are just write all this code. And I think actually the opportunity is that there's a lot more software in the world that could be written that does not get written today because lots of people who are suffering in all these different lines of business, all these little business groups, they can't afford to hire a software developer to solve their problems. So what's going to end up happening is that all of these people who otherwise were locked away from being able to have software automate their jobs, they are going to be able to self-service in this regard. Now, they might take a beat and think, wait, if I automate away my job, what does that mean, right? So they might think about that for a second, but, but we'll let them figure that out on their own. Every business, every business person has their own sort of figuring out to do on that one. But the ultimate, aim, the ultimate thing here is I think that we're not gonna end up with like the same amount of software and fewer software developers writing it. We're gonna end up with way more software written by way more people who are not software developers and most of it's gonna be even worse and crappier, right? So that's a business opportunity for many of you here in the room to think about. The second, another really key thing here is that if we do want to commercialize large language models, we have to solve the attribution problem. There's just no way around this incredibly big hard rock. This is just something we're gonna to have to solve. And um, that's not gonna rest entirely on the question of copyright versus fair use. I know right now there's lawsuits flying, there's people lawyering up, lawyers are gonna make a ton of money. I didn't put that in here, I should add that as a bullet point. Lawyers will make a ton of money, but that doesn't mean we're gonna resolve this 
in the battlefield of copyright versus fair use. Because there's many other rights, data rights and things like that, that fall, that start getting sucked into this vortex. And all of these, um, all of the parties fighting, because it's big tech and AI companies and all the VCs backing the AI companies. And on the other hand, you have everyone who's ever produced any content whatsoever. So you've got Taylor Swift and you've got J.K. Rowling and you've got Coldplay and you've got the Beatles, you've got everybody over here. So like, this is a clash of titans for real and everyone's gonna lawyer up and it's gonna go really hard, but they're not gonna be able to resolve it on the basis of fair use versus uh, copyright alone. That's my, that's my assertion, my hot take. Um, but instead, we need a new kind of holistic licensing model um, that, that cons con considers the data and the authorship of the data that actually affects the code as well, because it's not just the training data, it's not just the weights, it is the particular code, the particular model that then consumes that checkpoint of the weights and then produces an inference, right? But also the human training efforts. The most important, not important, but one of the most um, distinctive things about ChatGPT is the amount of human reinforcement uh, learning data that was included into it. And many people are trying to do this thing as well, recreate new data sets. At some point, the humans doing all that are going to wise up and say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. I want a piece of, I want some upside in that if I'm going to do this, right? So we're going to have an iteration on this thing, but ultimately, I think at the end of the day, for this stuff to actually clear all the different lawsuits and operate in a legally clear zone that makes businesses comfortable, we're going to have to fundamentally solve the attribution, mo the attribution problem in a way that yields economic upside to everyone, right? And, and the reason I bring this up here is because if you think about open source, that's one of the things that, that we fail to do very well in the open source community. We talk about maintainer burnout, people can take the code and use it for free, which is great, you also keep doing that. But when we go and we talk to businesses that rely on this code, no one's got budget for any of it, right? They just sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal for a trillion dollar company to even donate $100,000 to some open source project. When in fact, that open source project literally powers their core business. And so we see this happening over and over again. And I'm hoping that as we move into an era of AI, that we will come up with more equitable attribution models and more equitable economic models for this. And lastly, of course, big question. Um, I believe AGI is definitely possible, and not only that, I believe AGI is probably inevitable, based on what we've seen. Um, but, but by that, I don't necessarily mean quite what, like it's, it's not, not like everyone's gonna have like a brain in their pocket. I mean, you'll probably have a little brain in your pocket, but um, the idea that there'll be something transhuman intelligent, something that is able to synthesize way more data at way more scale, and yield predictions that are way more accurate than any human agent is able to do. I believe that's absolutely happening, or can happen. And if you look at the way the world works today, we essentially have an emergent, like horribly baby slime mold version of this happening anyway, in the electronic capital markets, and in all the online predictive systems that run so many different aspects of human logistics, and clearing, and settlement, and all these different kinds of things. So for me, this is almost, this is almost a settled question. I think we're going to produce transhuman intelligence. And the key question is, what are the values we want to put into that thing? What are the values? And I think it's unfortunate that we have to call this out so explicitly, but it's worth calling out. Based on everything we've seen from the last 20, 30, 40 years of open source software, that when we take something that produces generative economics, where it's a gift economy, where people come in and bring their ideas, and they work late nights, they sacrifice their chance of getting, uh, getting tenure, and they throw it all into this thing, and it produces this beautiful, it's almost like a clean burning, or clean, whatever, uh, reacting, nuclear reactor that produces terawatts of power for, an entire, for the entire civilization. We can do all that and then get none of the economic benefits, and the thing has to get patched up by volunteers working late at night. And then over here, the rest of the economic system just keeps running and running and running, as if we were still in an industrial fossil fuel era, right? So if we go and we produce transhuman intelligence, and we have that, we upgrade that nuclear reactor to become this incredible predictive engine for humanity. And we plug it right back into the same economic model. What will, what will happen with that, right? So the thing that's important to recognize, and I know some people here are maintainers and people who work in the core of this ecosystem, what we've seen in the last probably five, 10 years is that at the end of the day, those of us who work in the open source code community, we will not get asked our opinions as to how this thing goes. Right? They won't ask us for governance. They won't go and hold up and say, whoa, whoa, hold on. We have not actually talked to this particular maintainer yet in this GitHub repo. And that's a really important piece of software for us. They don't care. There is an emergent way the world works. There is a system of the world that consumes these artifacts 
with no, with no consideration to the values of the people of the communities that produce them. They take those artifacts and throw them into the machine, and the machine goes faster and better. Better. It goes faster. It goes harder. Um, so even today, if you think about what's happened in the open source world, when open source goes into a big business, they still have all the same people, all the same headcount, doing all sorts of maybe different things now, but they produce and they continue to run towering stacks of complexity, and they create these, and they have to have these things in order to create sort of a technological caste system to defend their budgets, to defend their jobs, and that's essentially the way the world works. That's why when I say 90% of white collar work is bullshit, that's, that's that. A lot is maintaining that technological caste system to maintain the structure of budget. Um, and so we end up, if we continue, if we just take all of this incredible innovation that could be coming from transhuman intelligence and we pile it into that same system, well, that caste system just gets fatter. Maybe a few more people get brought in at the bottom, but it just kind of gets fatter, right? And we end up right, running into some very hardcore Marxist critiques of the entirety of modernity, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I'll put it up here just for people to think about. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate this question that all of you working in this room inevitably are going to be in one way or another um, on the front lines, or at least maybe not the front lines, the second lines, in this transformation of the world that's about to happen. And so the important question to really hold and think about is, what are those values that we want to put into that system? What are my values that I want to hold as I engage and become one of the people on the front lines building this stuff and using this stuff and advising people how they should procure this stuff? This is something that we never talked about as a community back in 2015. This would have been like, hey, who's that crazy Marxist up there? What, what the hell is that? You know, his, his, his family fled communism. And he's up here talking about all this, like, he used the word capitalist up here. But the reason I'm calling this out now is having watched how the current systems of, of, of industry and, and whatnot have engaged and adopted open source over the last 10 years, it's absolutely clear to me that unless we as a community, as both a maker community and a practitioner community, unless we actually are explicitly driving this conversation about values, unless we're explicitly driving this conversation about equitable economics around this stuff, it will just go the way it's always gone. And that's not really sustainable, I think. So that's it. Thank you very much.